And our current uh, guest speaker tonight, Adam Block, I actually sort of bumped into him when I posted a question on one of the uh, chat forms on Facebook. Uh, I think it was Picks and Fight for Beginners. And Adam had the either good fortune or misfortune to actually post some answers to my questions, which resulted in him actually volunteering to take two hours out of his life, which he probably won't get back, to sit and actually help me process um, one of my, uh, two of my images uh, and deal with some really funky uh, issues that were happening with um, uh, some noise that was sneaking into the sensor and how to deal with cosmetic corrections and so forth. And after two hours of him helping me, I said, hey, you're really good at this. I said, how about, <laughs> would you mind, would you like to give a talk for our astronomy club? We actually have, you know, a handful of people who actually have an interest in this at a much deeper level, which resulted in Adam graciously saying, of course, he'd be interested. And so here he is tonight. So let me just give you a quick background on Adam, his biography. Uh, Adam is actually a professor out in Arizona. He developed a public observing program at the Kitts Peak Observatory between uh, 96 and 2005. He founded the Mount Lebanon Sky Center in 2007 at the University of Arizona, which has a 24 inch and a 32 inch telescope for public outreach. outreach. And he currently works at the Department of Astronomy at the University of Arizona, which I'm hoping, or I, I would have to presume, unless it's in the heart of Phoenix, probably has better skies than we do. <clears throat> Although if it's in the heart of Phoenix, it probably doesn't have better skies than we do. Um, <laughs> Adam's images are actually used as references by amateurs and professionals all over the world. Um, his, uh, the Space Telescope Science Institute at the Chandra Observatory and Spitzer and many other observatories around the world, and uses images for a variety of purposes. Um, he's had many images that have been in uh, National Geographic and NASA's Astronomy Field of the Day and on and on. And he's actually a Pix Insight ambassador and an all around nice guy and um, very, very helpful. And he has a website which, where he actually uh, sells his services in terms of uh, very excellent um, uh, online on demand lectures, which help get you up the curve really fast on a painfully difficult program picks insight and uh, with that i'm going to just turn it over to adam and say number one thank you for speaking tonight and number two thanks for helping me with those really ornery problems uh, on those images i had a few months ago well uh, thank you for the very nice introduction i uh, i appreciate it I, I do need to correct something though i'm not a professor i'm never sorry was never has been uh if you want to call me professor that's fine as long as this isn't gilligan's island it's okay but uh <laughs> I don't have otherwise the credentials for that. What I do have is an awful lot of experience in doing um, astrophotography, and that's part of what I'm going to be showing in this talk. So, uh, yeah, why don't I just bring up the screen and I'll give you um, some insight into where I want to go here. Let's see. I will want confirmation that you can see my screen. Yep. Okay. Yep. Now there's this thing that shows me that I am sharing and I never know what to do with it. It is always in my way. Well, we don't, we don't see it. I know I do and it's in my way, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, this presentation, again, thank you for inviting me. This presentation I call Gulping the Sky because that is effectively what I have done over the past you know, basically 25 years. And uh, in this talk, what I want to do is highlight a few threads that are uh, kind of like a theme or something that just reoccurs over and over again. And they deal with either things that I encounter, especially as it relates to some of the processing that um, I've done through the years in terms of astrophotography. So I'm going to highlight just a few of these things. I can only do so much in a kind of a short period of time. There's much more, actually, but I picked these three just because they were uh, somewhat sentimental to me here. Uh, to begin with, I wanna say that one of the things that I have been just very fortunate um, in is that I really began my experience in terms of digital astrophotography when it happened that uh, you know, digital sensors became available to the amateur community. And it was just in those years, in the early 1990s, that all of that started to happen. And I started right then. I was doing film before then, uh, but then in college, I had this wonderful opportunity to use what at the time was not really a sensor designed for taking pictures. I actually started with an ST4, 
uh, which is a guider. It's a, the Santa Barbara Instrument Group guider camera. Professionals would use this at the, at the professional observatories just to make the telescope track. There was one that was at the campus station uh, telescope, a 21 inch telescope. And uh, I started trying to take pictures with it. I think the first picture I ever took with a digital device uh, with this SD4 was the ring nebula. Terrible picture. I mean, it looked like a, you know, like a smoke ring, barely noisy thing. The image that's here on the screen is actually one that uh, I took subsequently. But what is nice about this image, and I think it really taught me something, is that this is the first kind of thing that you really couldn't see this with your eye very well through the telescope. This is NGC 2419, a globular cluster, very uh, far away one. And uh, suddenly on the screen, I could see something that by eye was very difficult to do. Uh, so that was a big hook for me for doing this kind of uh, imaging. Now later, of course, you know, I take uh, with better equipment and better techniques and better everything, uh, this is like a, a more recent, although it's not that recent, still an old image, but more recent uh, image of the exact same thing. So uh, later, um, I actually utilized that campus station telescope. So my experience in college was unique. Uh, I was the head telescope operator for the campus station. And at every moment that I could, I would try to use it to do what I could with it, including imaging. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is actually using, here is the telescope, um, using this telescope to image, uh, one of the cool things at the time was a comet Hyakutake when it was coming around um, in 96. So I'll show you those images in a moment. The fellow there is, a, he is a professor and he would have been the, uh, the quintessential astronomer of this 1960s, that's Dr. White, who I had courses with uh, at my time there. This is at a time that I was taking classes. Now, the telescope looks a little small, he's in the foreground, but it's this huge 21 inch telescope. It's big because it's F-15. Imagine an F-15 telescope, a 21 inch F-15. It's this crazy telescope. Um, and to try to take pictures with it with a tiny little sensor is very hard. It's like through a straw kind of thing. So here's an example of uh, one of those images. Uh, and this really got me started in terms of the connection with between public outreach and imaging, uh, digital imaging. So there were um, there was a need for people to take pictures of the comet because this thing was going to pass through very quickly, and so I started that process early in that spring. Uh, and one of the other interesting things, I just happened to look at the JPL site; they still have these images and archived. Uh, but the thing that makes this also memorable for me is you'll see that there's a name next to mine for a contributor, Miwa. Uh, Miwa is someone that I met in school, in college. You'll notice that the time that the picture was taken was 3 a.m. in the morning. So when most students are, uh, I don't know what they do on Friday nights, this was a Friday night at 3 a.m. in the morning, but it is not trying to take a picture of a dim comet in the sky. So I later married, or we married, and I've uh, been with Miwa ever since. So maybe that was fortuitous. This was very early in uh, getting together. So later that spring, I had a chance to basically be part of public outreach uh, for the, the Department of Astronomy by doing this live viewing of the comet, not having people look through the telescope, but instead um, attach the camera to the telescope, I think an ST6 at the, fine, at the time, and uh, deliver these live images of the comet. What makes it interesting is that you'll notice there's a little line behind the comet. That was real. There was some kind of jet thing going on. And uh, Pic du, du Midi, uh, one of the French observatories, was also observing something coming off the comet. So it made a little news that we happened to have some images that uh, no one else was really looking at at the time. And it confirms some of the things that they were seeing. So that was my beginnings in terms of digital kind of uh, uh, astrophotography continued with my work at the uh, Kitt Peak at the National Observatory. This is the 16 inch LX200 that I used to uh, develop those initial programs for the visitor center. This is a great telescope if you're gonna look through it. It's a terrible telescope if you wanna take a picture with it, uh, but that didn't stop me. I didn't know any better. I began what is basically an astrophotography program 
as part of these outreach experiences. And um, that was kind of a tough thing to do with that particular telescope. Uh, and I'd like to kind of give a sense of why it was so difficult. It, the telescope was kind of the anti telescope for doing astrophotography. Um, and the main reason, many reasons in terms of design, both optically and mechanically, uh, but in terms of one of the mechanical issues is the fact that there is backlash in the declination drive and the declination gear in particular. And uh, one of the things that I desired to do was to take advantage of a very well-known technique. If you don't want to encounter backlash, that is by reversing directions when you're guiding on a guide star, every time you reverse direction, you're pressing the button to make the telescope you know, follow the guide star, but it doesn't do anything because it, it's moving, but there's enough slop in the gears that it doesn't um, engage the gears. That's the backlash. And that problem means that you don't want to ever reverse direction. You want to guide without reversing direction, if that's possible, which it is. And uh, what I wanted to do then was somehow turn off one of the relays, um, you know, only press the button in the north direction or only press the button in the south direction, and then you can improve the guiding. So uh, you'll notice here, this is in the guider settings for MaximDL, the software. It used to be back, you know, 15, 20 years ago that Maxim, whenever it was first made, when MaximDL had um, the settings here, they weren't nearly as um, numerous as what you see now, uh, but the setting would only enable you to turn on and off declination or right ascension, not north or south relay, but the whole thing, or they're either both on or both off. So because there wasn't a software solution at the time, I asked an individual to help me make this thing, uh, an actual inline device we would uh, splice into the wires for the guider cable and put it through this box that he soldered the in innards for me so that we would take the two relays and then by a mechanical switch on the outside of the box, I could disable one of the two um, connections that is the pulse for the north or the south. So I did it mechanically with some help here, but, but eventually in software it became available and actually in MaximDL because of me. I said, Doug, I said to Doug, Doug George, please, help me. <laughs> this seems like an obvious thing to have. So that's why that exists now here, plus and minus X. It would probably have gotten there anyway, but at my insistence, it got there more quickly than it might have otherwise been. So that was a, a big innovation for me. This is what it looks like when you have guiding only occurring in one direction. It will improve the guiding by, it basically halves the errors. You'll see here where I've got it that the star will drift up and then you pull it down and then it'll drift up and it'll pull it down, drift up, pull it down, drift up, pull it down. If it overcorrects, it's just gonna drift up on its own and then you just pull it back down um, so that you're not reversing the, uh, the backlash and that improves the guiding by orders of, well, at least half, order of magnitude. In fact, uh, you know, getting in line now with some of the processing that I want to show you and how that thread follows through. Here we have uh, the, probably the only image, at least uh, astronomy picture of the day that I am aware of, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, is a deep sky photo using digital, you know, a sensor, in this case, uh, one of the SBIG sensors, um, uh, done with an LX200. I am unaware of any other. So that's hard. It was really hard to get one of these things to work. So I really did put in my sweat equity in order to you know, make a system like that work. And that really did obviously teach me a lot about uh, astrophotography. One of the other curious things about this is I always had someone watching me do it because these were all part of the program. So I wasn't alone. I was always with guests when trying to make the system work and go. So that, that is a, the beginnings of what I was doing with regards to initial stuff. And it really dealt with uh, more of the acquisition side of things. Later, of course, when equipment and so on improves, the processing becomes important. And that's really what I wanna highlight here. The, of the three threads, this one is probably the most uh, significant, which is the high dynamic range kind of uh, management that's necessary 
when dealing with images, especially astronomical images. So I wanted to illustrate an example, and I think in a previous, another slide here, I get the order correct now, I, I don't know what happened. So here we have, the order really should be Ansel Adams here first, I messed up. If you wanna go chronologically, there has always been this issue, even with film, where you want to expose things so you're showing as much of the dim and the bright things, whatever the scene might have, simultaneously. So Ansel Adams would be very famous for the manipulation of tonal values and images in order to display what he wanted to, uh, that he, you know, the way in which he saw the scene. And so that is one way to certainly kind of manipulate those tonal values and get the result that you want. I think the most spectacular example though, of this management of the large range of uh, brightnesses, especially in astronomical work, uh, first began with actually atomic bombs. So Charles Wyckoff um, worked to solve a very particular problem, which is develop a film that would allow you to expose the very bright part of the flash of an atomic explosion. And then the fainter part where you have the fireball, that's not as bright as the initial, the initial flash. So they worked on developing basically um, two kind of two or more layers of film that would be exposed differently depending upon the brightness of the light. And so that's another way to handle this problem of high dynamic range. David Mallon now working towards, this is later in time, working more towards uh, astronomical work also developed certain kinds of techniques, uh, one of which he called photographic amplification. Again, moving towards this idea of managing different brightness levels, many things in astronomy, galaxies, planetary nebula, star clusters, just about everything, they all have these radial profiles where they tend to be very bright in the center and very faint in the outer, uh, you know, outskirts of whatever the object is. And so to be able to show all of those, um, all of that information in some reasonable way, especially if you're doing astrophotography in a natural way, that becomes um, a very valuable or aesthetically pleasing thing to do. So one of the things that became available, and this would have been in the mid nineties or late nineties is uh, a particular um, algorithm. And this would now be with digital sensors called DDP. One of the things about uh, the sensors that we use, CCD sensors and CMOS sensors, is they tend to have a large dynamic range. Um, a 16 bit sensor, for example, can basically enumerate, can count 65,000 discrete brightness levels, but your computer monitor can only display 256 of them. So, how you choose to display that information is this management of that dynamic range. And DDP provides a method to do this. So this was an early algorithm that works kind of like a film response. You would use this algorithm on an image like this here. It looks like the galaxy is overexposed in the center. It's not, it's just the display of it. And then you use this tool to somehow modify that, that image so that you can say, see both the inner and outer parts of it. Here's another galaxy, you use this tool. This is, an, <laughs> this is a screenshot from the version of Maxim DL that is 15 years old or whatever it is. And it had this uh, digital development uh, capability here. So this was influential in the community at the time. Uh, before this kind of DDP stuff, it was really hard. You had to use some kind of logarithmic stretch and they, they were ugly because you raised too much of the, the faint noisy stuff uh, while trying to display everything else you really want to display, DDP was the, uh, the best option that was available at the time. But as with any process, it also came with its own artifacts and things that you have to deal with. That is always true with almost every uh, one of these techniques and methods. So this is the end result of what an image like that at that time, 15 or more years ago that I was producing here, is what the color image of that galaxy looked like. And here is another um, result with that. Um, I don't remember, this might've been with the 20 inch, yeah, this would have been with the 20 inch telescope when I was at Kit Peak. So this was not the 16, this would have been with the 20 inch RC with the sensors and everything at the time. Which one is that? Is that M74? No, uh, oh, I didn't label it, did I? Uh, 
Oh, 36, 30. 36, I don't, I don't look it up. I yeah. don't remember. <laughs> I didn't label it. I'm sorry. Hold on. I have it here. 30. What does that say? 39, 38. There we go. Thank you. Yes. All right. So now progressing through time later, uh, a new advance happened, which is that digital development was still the thing to manage this dynamic range of brightnesses. But now there became a new thing, which is that up until this point, whenever you're looking at images, uh, this truly visualizing them in your software, usually it was in some linear way where you would move around sliders, you can see dim and bright things, but there wasn't a nonlinear way to uh, visualize the information. And so here in CCD Stack, Stan Moore, the author, decided, and rightfully so, to put just the screen stretch, the visualization of the information to be presented in this nonlinear way. And that is a big boon for making good decisions in terms of processing, because you can actually see what effectively in advance things will look like later when you permanently stretch the image. Uh, so this was a very important, I think, step, and I used it to great advantage when creating you know, my astrophotography at this time. So here's an image of M83. It already looks kind of good on the screen, and that is because you can't, probably can't see this easily here, but there's a little DDP uh, checkbox here, and that is what is enabling this nonlinear representation. So closer now to today, I just would like to point out an example where uh, this HDR technique, uh, in this case, it's uh, called HDRMT, as is um, implemented in PixInsight, yet another algorithm. It's not DDP. It has another kind of way of working. And it allows for a different kind of result. And I'm going to actually show you what that looks like. So this is the dangerous part where I do something relatively live. I'm not going to do something hard live, but I am going to do it. So here we have the image of the galaxy. And this has, uh, as you can see, it's a very bright galaxy. This is uh, what is effectively M102, but arguably is M102 because of how you, whether you consider it in the Messier catalog or not, is a very famous galaxy. So it's uh, NGC 5866. And in all images of it, in fact, I'm now gonna show you this because I just wanna prove the point. No, you know what? I'm gonna show it to you in a different way. I changed my mind. I'm gonna show it to you in this way. If we go to Google Images and we type NGC 5866 and you just scan the images of this galaxy, the very typical image that you'll see, at least the older version of images that you see look like this. That's it, that's what you get. It just looks like you can tell in the brightest part it's the spindle-like galaxy. And then you have these marvelous images that are from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope that again, just show that inner structure. But what they don't show is what I have in my, um, let me go back to my thing here. Hang on, I'm gonna close this because that'll confuse me. Is that outer structure, wouldn't it be great if you could display both the inner and outer structure at the same time? HST doesn't have the field of view. If it did, maybe they could process it, but it doesn't. It only has the field of view of the very center. So in there, tucked away, is the cool stuff. Here's the algorithm that does the job. If I load HDRMT, which is here, let's see, HDRMT here, and I apply what are hopefully the correct settings to this image, now I have something that I can begin to work on this data in hopes of being able to display it and color it and all of that in a proper way, which will you know, give me the best possible image, but do it in a way that has also a natural look to it. One of the things that you'll note here is that there unfortunately are, as you might imagine, there are always going to be some form of uh, artifact again. You get kind of a darkening around some of the bright stars. So to counteract that, you create special masks that would help with that. And then at the end of the day, you end up with the result that you want, uh, which I may actually have here if I, uh, now I probably don't have it here. Okay, well, you get the right result when you um, apply the mask. Here is this result where you can, let's see, close this, thank you. 
where you can see that I've taken care of the, the artifact of uh, the HDRMT and I'm left with what I actually want. So the importance of this is that, let's see, it allows you to do some interesting things. Here, now I'm gonna say that we really get this full view of the galaxy, but more important to me is that not only do we get the full view of the outer parts, look what we also get as a benefit is the inner parts showing some, um, you know, the difference of color. You can see at the tips of the, the disc of the galaxy, as well as maybe some of those little dust lanes that are just coming off uh, in the inner structure of the galaxy there. So now we get this more whole, whole view of everything. It's a representation that I think tells a better story than what you'll find. And still today, actually, there are very few images of this particular galaxy. And so for me, it's, it was, um, it, this is a good example of how I would say is telling a story in a way that, that hasn't been told for this galaxy before. And I think that's very, very powerful. That's why it matters. That's the new interpretation. So let me show you very quickly. So can you speak for a moment in terms of like what's what the algorithm is doing? Is it actually making two versions and then blending them together? Or are you making two versions and then no. adding them together? Or is it what precisely allowed that to happen? Oh, uh, well, probably more time than I can take in this talk. Um, but the, the, uh, the algorithm works on a uh, uh, wavelets actually. And so you can specify a scale at which you're going to do this uh, compression of the brightnesses. And so that's part of the algorithm. Um, and then I am, and additionally, I'm doing another thing, which is I am then blending that result with the original image in a special way using a mask. So all of that goes into the final kind of result that you see there. But the original algorithm works on uh, wavelets actually, it's pretty cool. So let me show you some examples. And the examples that I want to show here are, let's go to, oh, I should have been here are on my website and I want to use my website mostly, this is my gallery website, uh, because you know when people show images of things, it is often the case that you get this kind of zoomed out image that you know a lot of people process images to look good when they're small. It is another level of processing to produce an image that looks good at the intrinsic um, plate scale, that the intrinsic scale that the image was acquired at. That's another level up, I think. And uh, that's something that I certainly strive for in my own um, astrophotography, no matter which kind of system I'm using. So here is an example, and, and I just said I was gonna show you the big example. Let me show you the entire view. Here is the, uh, the Lagoon Nebula, and it is only with and because of the use of that HDRMT algorithm that I could even get close to doing what you're seeing here. I think that within this view, it gives you that level of depth because you can still see the highlighted things, but at the same time, see all the very faintest structures that are within here, the uh, Lagoon Nebula. And that really lends itself, I think, to a, a compelling image. So this I would claim is a, is a new, again, kind of rendering of a very famous object done in perhaps a different way. Um, another example is, let's see, hold on. What did I have? Oh, okay. Galaxy. Where's the data coming from, Alec, Adam? Um, so in a moment, I'm going to show you the, the uh, various telescopes that I'm using. Mm. I, I did not separate these chronologically or by telescope or anything like that. I'm showing you things that are relevant to the kind of processing I was doing. But in a moment, I'll show you some of the telescopes. All of these, of course, specify this one, for example, was with the 32-inch telescope. Um, when I worked at uh, Mount Lemmon. So here's a beautiful galaxy. And again, in order to see all of this structure inside and see this very, very faint stuff going on on the outside required the use of HDRMT. And maybe one final one here, let's see. Oh yeah, recent one that I worked on some more galaxies. Uh, M88, the new M88. Let's see, I guess that is the new M88. Hang on. Oh, yeah. Get thing about being something? live. So here's M88, beautiful galaxy. Again, HDRMT coming to the rescue here. I think this is actually the large view. And uh, 
most importantly, a galaxy that most people, it's unappreciated, it's a very bright galaxy, but uh, NGC 3310, which is here, just this insanely crazy galaxy. Uh, and if you look at the zoomed out view, there's unfortunately, the reason it's not known very well is there's a bright star next to like a six magnitude star, fifth maybe next to it. But it has these wonderful loops of gas and dust uh, exterior to it that you can bring out in addition to the, uh, the HDRT MT development um, treatment that I use there. So that was kind of, uh, some of the examples of how powerful this particular thread has and the evolution of it through time. Now, these are some of the telescopes that I've used to acquire all of these images that I've been showing so far, and I have more to show you. Uh, so like I said, it began with the LX200 here. Uh, then I convinced uh, Brad Airhorn to make available a 20-inch RC, uh, RCOS telescope for the visitor program. And uh, later, of course, I uh, did more of that effort at Mount Lemmon with uh, both the 24 inch and 32 inch telescopes. Today, I'm uh, lucky to be able to use on the left is the Takahashi Epsilon to do some wide field imaging in between the science that I use it for. And then on the right, I have had uh, some opportunities. I've paid for some time at the uh, Telescope Live um, telescope to acquire some data from Chile, which is really wonderful stuff. Another thread, completely different thread, all right? So these are not related in any particular way, but they're important, I think, in the history of what people consider important to do in terms of processing. Uh, there is always this desire when taking pictures of very starry fields to, in some particular images, de-emphasize stars. You know, if you just make them completely go away, like in the image behind me, that offers one view. But what is sometimes nice is you wanna show the stars but you just don't want them to be a distraction. So it used to be that an erosion filter, the minimum filter, especially in Photoshop, and again, this is like 15, 10, 15 years ago, that was the way that this was done. You would, uh, you would make a selection around stars and then you would de-emphasize them with an erosion filter. And I would actually like to show that to you. I have here that very image. Now this unfortunately is not the best image to demonstrate this, but uh, what the heck, I'll just show you. Um, if I do zoom out like this, what you can do initially to do this somewhat correctly is you would make a selection here and you can just select by highlights. That's the easy way to do this. Then you would, this is the, this is stuff I don't do anymore, but uh, this is the way it would have been done, you know, 15 years ago. So you expand the selection. Now I have basically just the stars or the stars that I care about. Uh, then you can feather that selection. Let's see, I'll feather it, whatever. I'll make the selection disappear so it's not annoying to us. You zoom in and then the filter that's used is the minimum filter. Now there's two different ways that the minimum filter is applied. You can either do the squareness thing and this was the way that the filter existed um, forever in Photoshop until a certain point in time. And the thing is that every time people used the minimum filter uh, to minimize their stars, you, would always, you could always tell because the stars turned into little diamonds. It was just a function of the geometry of the kernel of this filter that it made them look like little diamonds. And uh, to my eye, to, or at least to my philosophy, if you can tell what I did, you know, which process I actually used, I say I didn't do it very well. If you can tell what I did, I didn't do it good. So uh, I never really liked to use it and I always wanted some variation of it. So I told one of the developers at a conference, I said, hey, Alan, you know, would it be possible to make this filter instead of it being square some other way so that it didn't make little diamonds of stars? And so today you'll now find that there is a roundness version of this kernel filter that doesn't make the stars um, look like diamonds and it produces this you know, erosion-like effect. So if I now apply this here and we zoom out, uh, this will be only a very modest effect. But if you look at the before, this is gonna be hard. Yeah, this is, I didn't really do a very big effect here, but before and after some of the stars are being so ever so slightly affected there. 
I would probably, because I was using that, let's see. I'm going to go crazy here just so I can show you. Let's say we were going to, oh, I see why. I had to set it there. That will probably help me. In fact, I'm going to make it like crazy dramatic like that. There. Now let's zoom out. And if you do before and after now, now you can see how the stars are being diminished and that in some way helps the visibility of the nebulosity. Okay. Uh, uh, today, today, would you still do this or would you do no. like a morphological transformation? Or something? Wait a second. Oh, I get even better. Okay. Check out my next slide. You're like, you're like, uh, this is like the softball. You're giving me softballs. So that's wonderful. Uh, one of the things that, again, there's this desire to always want to do this, right? Uh, through time, everyone has always wanted a good way to do this. So morphological selection in PixInsight is the way that you would do it in PixInsight. But I wanted to approach it in a different way. So I actually came up with my own method, my own technique um, that I thought would be of interest to the astronomical community, because this is just something that everyone does. And you'll notice on the right, when you use, again, any kind of erosion filter, uh, you're still going to get some kind of artifacts here. And these artifacts are the things that I want to avoid, because, again, I don't want to know that I used it in a way. I want to hide that a little bit, right? So on the left, you can see my particular technique uh, does something a little bit better with regards to those, uh, out, you know, those aberrations. And this technique is a completely different way of approaching the problem. So now I'm gonna go into, oh, I missed it, PixInsight. The way my technique works is the following. What you do is you take an image like this, a very starry field of some kind, and then you create, nowadays we have the ability, we can create these starless versions of images using yet another algorithm. And what you want to do is where there are stars, what, that you want to de-emphasize, you make a mask that's like a little uh, annulus, a little donut mask. So the center of the star is not affected. Only the outer edge of the star is affected. And instead of using an erosion filter, which would take these pixels and draw them in, that makes the, uh, that makes the artifacts, instead take the pixels that are created by this other algorithm it makes its best guess at what should be there. So it's like a content aware image and then substitute them. Don't take from neighboring values here, actually take values from this other image and then make a substitution. And the cool thing, this other image you can generate in any number of ways. So it's substitute pixels that you're going to be substituting in here. Now I'm not gonna go through my process. I will say that if you go to my YouTube channel, I have uh, the details of how you do this relatively quickly, the steps that you would do in PixInsight. However, uh, one of the, uh, the coolest things that's happened is that an individual thinking that this technique was of some interest, he actually made a script that is now available in PixInsight of my very technique. There is no higher praise, I think. I mean, that's the coolest thing, a higher reward anyway, a uh, coolest thing that I could ever see happen is that someone made a script based on my thing. That is so cool. So here it is. It actually goes through the steps and basically does the job. What you do is you would have to watch my video to kind of understand the technique. And then all of these little boxes make sense because these are the steps that you basically do. But if I put this here, you know, somewhere in the image there, we'll say there, uh, and I, it needs to know, again, the, the actual image in the starless version. And then you set these values. And I don't know if they're perfect or not, but I'll set the values here. Here's what it does is it, it generates the luminance version of the image because it needs to know where the stars are. So there's a way to easily create a star mask. And those are these two steps here. You do this easily in PixInsight with MLT. Then you dilate the mask. And here uh, you make it a little fuzzy. Here is the clever thing that I did in my technique is I subtract the luminance image itself from the halo, uh, from, the, from these, Im uh, these things in the mask to make halos. So this makes perfect star halos. 
that then you put where this is, you put the substitute values of the starless image in that place, and you get an end result which looks like a mess here because I don't have this properly set here. Let's just try to fix it if I can. Oh, that's a little better. But if you look at the before and the ah, the before and the after, you can see that the stars get de-emphasized. And that's basically the technique, but it is a different approach to doing it rather than using the ero erosion filter. So I just wanted to point that out. I should have kept that. And uh, when set up properly, you do get this effect of being able to shrink down stars with the minimization of the, uh, the artifacts of what would typically be the process used. Yeah, there's the cool script that the guy made. Very cool. And then the last thing that uh, I want to point out is something that deals with, yeah, here we are, that deals with um, problem images, basically. This is always uh, you know, a problem solving kind of thing. And this particular slide comes from, I believe it's 2007, when I delivered this presentation uh, for the Advanced Imaging Conference. And this particular slide is of some importance to me because it is the first time that uh, when I showed the result, uh, there was actually an applause where people stood up. I mean, I couldn't believe it. People were clapping like crazy because it really illustrates that if you use some things to your advantage, you can do some pretty cool things. Uh, and this is an example where here on the right, I claimed that there's no reason to throw away that image. The only thing wrong with this image, this is a 10 minute exposure that has eight minutes of goodness and then two minutes of a loss of tracking, right? And so what I demonstrated is you can take the difference between an image and uh, another image to basically isolate uh, what are basically just the star uh, trails. And then you can use this image to subtract from the original and basically correct it. And people just went crazy. They thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Now, this is not the, the best way of doing it, although it is a way to do something like this. Uh, but the better way of doing this is, of course, with statistical rejection. And that's the way it's done today. But this theme of trying to find these various ways of rejecting uh, things that shouldn't be in your images, it could be transitory, you know, everything from cosmic rays to artifacts of the sensor, whatever it might be, that's always an issue. And finding good techniques is uh, an important one. So again, going back in time, one of the first times this really became a powerful thing to do is with CCD stack. So I think I'm gonna show you first something here. Whenever you take a picture, you have values, every single pixel records a whole bunch of values. So if you have 30 images, you have 30 values at every pixel. That's what's going to be in some way mathematically combined to create the final image, which is just have one value per pixel. And then you do that through every pixel and you get an image. Um, so here I have in indicated that here are all the values that I took for some data. Um, and you'll notice they're all very, very similar. And I have them arranged uh, in terms of uh, increasing size until you get to the bottom here. And then you have a couple of values which are significantly, and I say significantly in the sense in a moment you'll see, different than all the others. So you'll see that most of the values, if you make a histogram of what I just had, uh, they're all over here kind of clumped together. And then just visually you can tell, well, these other two values, they seem like they're very different. And so very likely they are not, they are outlying values. They're not what you wanna use when you average all the other values together to give you your final picture. So this is a method of doing this statistical analysis, which is what you do here with standard deviation and things like that to identify outlying values. You can take advantage of this though, when you do it with software like CCD stack, because you might have here, let me show you. I am flipping through the images. Can you see how some of the images have this garbage here? This is because of bad flat fields and dust on the filters and things didn't work out. 
So a lot of people would throw that away. I don't throw anything away. This has been the thing, the theme of my life. I try to keep as much as I can. Um, and so take advantage of ways in which that's possible. You'll notice that um, what I've done here is I, let me just show you this. If we run this, this is that statistical analysis that I just showed you. If you run this, it will highlight in red everything that it's going to reject. So for example, you'll see random pixels here. If I zoom in, that become red, those might be some of the you know, uh, cosmic rays and other things, but then you get satellite trails. That all comes out from the math. But what doesn't get rejected are these dust donuts where they exist in the images. So let me show you an example of where they were really, okay. So in these three images, for example, they're really quite bad. I'm just gonna show you. Here's the thing that became available. It's what I would call selective rejection. You can, uh, let's see, where is it? Oh, freehand. You can paint on the image, well, that might be large, the regions that you want to be rejected, just straight up rejected. So that means these values in this particular image, so this is only one value per pixel in this image, but all of these pixels I'm, in, I'm you know, not going to include here. Let me go, sorry, there seems to be a delay here. Hang on, I'm trying to find all of my, oh, there they are. So I would go around and do this. Now this is not the most fun and exciting way of doing this, right? But you would go around and do this on every image where there was a problem. And then at the end of the day, you would combine these images in such a way, which I guess I can do here, such that the combined image would not show, if I had done it properly on all of them, would not show the, the uh, dust donuts. It wouldn't have that problem anymore. So that's a way to selectively reject on top of the statistical rejection that you would do mathematically. And this first became available basically in a real substantive way uh, for amateurs here, I would say in CCD stack. Now, within the realm, however, of what is done today in like PixInsight, uh, I developed another kind of technique for PixInsight itself. Now, the technique that I just showed is well known, but it wasn't possible to do easily in PixInsight. So let me show you an example of what I mean by bringing up my Blink tool, which this desktop has too many things on it right now, I apologize. But let me just show you an example where it was absolutely 100% necessary to use this idea in order to get uh, a good result. So back in 2016, I worked with this data here. So I have this. And I'm going to show you, I think, the actual images here. Okay, here they are. So here we are, and if you'll notice, that we have these, again, these dust donuts running around in this image. I don't know if this is clear, but they are everywhere in here. Can you see the donuts there? Yes. Yeah, not good. Not good if you wanna make a nice pretty picture. And they're, and they're not only in that spot, but it's just that I didn't, unfortunately the flats either didn't work out or I didn't have them on a particular night. So all of the dust was scattered throughout certain frames. Now, not in every frame, but in some frames, the dust donuts were just everywhere in the image. And you want to try to get rid of, there's another one. You wanna to try to get rid of them if you can. Otherwise it just totally ruins the image, right? And so I took advantage of, uh, I worked with the developer actually. There's a cool tool here that is called, let me just show it to you. I'm trying to, oh yeah, called the game script. Now I am on, Let's see, I'm looking at an image which doesn't really matter here. I'll look at a different image here. There, pretend I had a problem in this image. What you end up doing is you could now just draw with these cool little tools here. 
you can draw over the problems, which you can, you only have to draw all of your problems uh, on one particular image. And then you output, here's the cool thing, you output those, um, in this case, it's black zero values to every pix every image that has that problem. And you can do it in a single button press. So it only takes me one or two minutes to draw on one image. And then I output it on all the images that have the problem. And then I can do the combination to make a good result. And so that's what I'm finally gonna show you here is that image that I just showed. Let me show you the final result of it. It is, I'm gonna search here for 125. Yeah, right here. I would not have been able to produce this image had it not been for this technique. Oh, that's the inverted image. That's the late, oh, this is the one I want. The cool thing, these are interacting galaxies. To my knowledge, I don't believe there's another high resolution picture of these particular galaxies running around, not in color and not showing all of these various features. The cool thing is you can see the, uh, the clouds of dust that are in the foreground as this galaxy is kind of being torn apart. That's pretty cool. And then this galaxy has this wonderful loop and there's some other tidal tails that are somewhat visible here in this image. And then if you just kind of scroll around, there's other beautiful galaxies uh, you know, running around in the background universe. None of this in my mind would have really been possible. Could, I couldn't execute that had I not done this. Uh, another good recent example where it was very important was uh, NGC uh, 1300, this image. Uh, because this image is so low to the south, it means that I'm overlooking the uh, city of Tucson. And that wreaks havoc with uh, the ability for flat fields to do their jobs well. And so once again, I, I fell upon the need to do the selective rejection in order to produce an image, which really I thought uh, would you know, be a good representation of this particular galaxy. Ah, let me go back to my presentation. Now I promised to make this a 45 minute to an hour and I believe that I'm right about that time frame now. Does that sound about right? Yeah. How much time would I have? When did I start? I don't know when I started. started Adam, uh, take your time, just don't. Uh, yeah. I, what know. time did I start? Tell me again the time I started. About 8.35. You're good. Yeah. 8.35. Yeah. So according to you, I would have about 10 minutes. Is that correct? Or five minutes? Yeah. Or something. Okay. So I don't know. That's, that's Whatever just, you need. Whatever yeah, you need. I know, but I like, to be, I like to be on time. Oh, I don't want to do that screen. Hold on. So, just, you know, this is the result of being in this field, doing this as your day job for 25 years. For those yeah. of us who aren't worthy of that level of <laughs> of um right yeah you know how do you come up the curve you know even one or two steps where you've gone up the curve you know 312 okay so there's there's a couple of things 25 years is a long time i just want to say that i um i'm no longer i can't claim i'm young anymore but i'm not that old either so i've really spent a lifetime doing this right uh, but there's one thing that uh, certainly I had to my advantage, especially because of the public programs that I ran in one or two months, uh, because the weather here was good and it was my job effectively. I had the experience, the troubleshooting, the, the everything from acquisition to processing that many people might get in a year, right? In just two or three months worth of time. Uh, so many sessions of me working on stuff constantly that certainly provided me a base very early on. So the answer to the question is just literally practice. It really is seeing pattern recognition, seeing what works, what doesn't work, appreciating those things uh, that you know are reproducible and make sense. And then you, you remember those things. It's really a lot of pattern recognition and an understanding of how and why things work. And that comes with practice. A lot of that comes with practice. It also comes with uh, being attentive to, you know, uh, studying a little bit of uh, how particular algorithms might work and do their job. And uh, that's the take that I have anyway, is that I like to know, uh, I don't like things to be a black box. I really want to understand how they're working. So for me, I, I uh, benefited from that understanding. Practice, I think that's the answer though. <laughs> So getting your 10,000 hours. So in Arizona, yeah. get your 10,000 yeah. hours in in a couple of weeks. Here in Connecticut, it'll take us a couple of lifetimes. Give uh, yeah, break. maybe, maybe. 
But, you know, nowadays there are other ways you can experience that. Uh, you know, in terms of processing, of course, it doesn't require the acquisition. There are plenty of data out there, you know, anything from remote observing to just using uh, freely available data. Of course, I provide data as part of my coursework uh, that people can uh, play with. And that's a form of learning. It doesn't matter when the data was taken or who took it, right? In terms of just getting in front of a software and manipulating that information, that's, that's learning right there. You learn a lot. Yeah. So uh, as a last little thing, then let me just kind of highlight some of the consequences and just some thoughts that I have about uh, some particular images. Uh, one of the recent things that I was lucky enough to have happen is that I, I wrote, um, it's not like an official paper, but they treat it like that. You have to go through the same kind of, uh, uh, what would be the word, uh, rigorousness that you need to you know, to submit something as if it were for a scientific journal. Uh, but I did that for a discovery. So in the course of doing my observations, one of the things that I had a chance to work on was, let's see, do I have, okay, hold on, let's go to, oh, uh, hang on, too many windows here. Ah, there it is. So this is the actual online published thing, but it was of this galaxy, uh, NGC 3614. I discovered, and this is only because I applied all of these you know, techniques from the HDR compression to cleaning up the image, making sure that uh, artifacts didn't reign supreme, that I discovered that this galaxy has um, some tidal tails. And these, are, these tidal streams are of some interest because uh, scientifically, it tells about the, the history of the formation of galaxies, both past mergers and what they might be doing today. Uh, in a hierarchical sense, you might imagine that uh, cosmologically galaxies could have been built from smaller interactions. And so you would expect to see perhaps even today these interactions still taking place. So all of that um, leads credence to this idea of trying to find good examples and this is one I got, I had discovered, which is really kind of cool. Uh, so let me show you some pictures that are of that nature. Oh, I didn't mean to get off of that. Going back to my gallery. Uh, you know, here's, here's another example of the kind of thing that I think is really interesting. Uh, so I just happened to see this today. There's an article that someone, I think this is Ethan, uh, wrote on planetary nebula and things like that. But mentioned in the article was the Calabash Nebula. This is something that's been imaged by Hubble Space Telescope. And you might wonder, it's the coolest thing in the world, but you might wonder what the color of the nebula actually is. I mean, what does it really look like if you took a picture with a ground-based telescope? There are none, there are zero. You can look up Calabash Nebula here in Google images, and there just aren't any color images, partly because it's a small, object and it is also uh, relatively faint, but that didn't stop me. So I tried to do exactly that and take a picture of it. I wonder if I have a link here. Yeah, let's see, that's Pinter. I don't know, let's see if I can find my real page here. So this would be www. Uh, yeah, this would be the place to go here. And if I do uh, M46, that should get me close. Oh, not M46, it would be uh, 2438, which is the actual, yeah, here it is. There it is. So that's what it looks like in relation to it. So this is the planetary nebula in M46. So many people can see this, you can see the outer halo. And then that is what it looks like if you take a picture of it with the ground-based telescope. So to me, that's the coolest thing in the world to be able to do that kind of thing where there may not exist a picture of it. I didn't know what color it was going to be. In fact, that's kind of a repeated theme for me through time is to take pictures of things where there may not exist a nice high resolution picture of it. So let me show you another, what is my quintessential example is this nebula, which is SH2239. At the time that I took this picture, eight, nine, I don't remember when, eight or nine, maybe 10 years ago, um, there just were no nice pictures of it. And um, 
So generating a picture like this to me was really a great way to share. It has wonderful reach in terms of astrophotography. And as an astrophotographer, it had this unique thing in that when I was working with the data, there were no references. There's nothing else I can look at to tell me what it should look like. So I had to use my technique, my decision-making process, everything that goes into making every other image that I make, I use that here to produce the image. And so it, I think it shows that authenticity in applying that decision-making and applying those techniques that I've, some of the things that I've described here to create a compelling image. And that's something that people always ask too, is how do you know that that's what that really looks like? And, so I, and, you know, right. And right. that's, that's a good example of that. It's a good example, but I want to be clear. Part of it is that, you know, in terms of broadband imaging, there are constraints, right? The constraints of the mixing of colors is something that you want to get right. But in terms of the brightness profile, in terms of that dynamic range, that's a choice I get to make. And so that's part of the decision-making process that I'm going to make in terms of the contrast of the image, the color saturation, all of that goes into it. Uh, but there are constraints in broadband imaging. Many of those constraints, by the way, are removed uh, when you're doing narrowband imaging, right? Uh, so all this stuff here is broadband, not narrowband, which has its own kind of technical difficulty. Um, let me show you, if I type rectangle in here, will I come up with anything? Yes, I do. Show it to me. Have this many photos and you get lost and not know, <laughs> you know where everything's at. I mean, that's, that's a hell of a problem to have. So uh, an image like this is the other extreme, um, which is that, you know, you can look at an image and you can say per pixel, how big the image is per amount of time that you spent, right? So this is a kind of image which is a very high ratio in terms of the amount of time spent considering the size of the image that it is. Uh, so this is a tiny, tiny object, but I spent a lot of time. And again, using the, especially here again, this high dynamic range thing, to be able to display something. Uh, this is a, a, a super well-known object because of HST. It's the red rectangle uh, nebula, but it's only red in the HST image because of the coloring that they, they just chose that color uh, because it does have red wavelengths of light, but they didn't take a broadband image. I wanted to know what it looked like you know, just RGB image. This is what it looks like. Uh, you can see the star actually has a blueness to it because you can see some scattered light in the blue and the diffraction. Uh, and there's a kind of a yellow orange in the center because of those blues. And then yes, it is certainly red, but this kind of gives you, I think, that perspective that otherwise would just not be obvious. And so these are kind of the special images for me for that reason is that I, I really got to investigate the universe in a way that you know, a few people really get a chance to do. And I think that's fun. And I think other people can do it as well, but you got to think creatively about the way in which you investigate the universe. Two more images I just want to highlight. One is this one, uh, where I just chose to stare at Betelgeuse using the astrograph for how many hours? You know, so I spent 1.5 hours worth of time in each filter staring at the star. Because I wanted to see, you know what, normally when you look at a bright star, no one bothers to do this because the starlight is just so much, you know, you can't really see a lot around it. But in actuality, you can see some cool stuff and it gives you a kind of perspective about things that you might not have otherwise paid attention to. So taking pictures of things that are even the most well-known objects and showing them in different ways, I think is a particularly uh, fun thing to do in astrophotography. And as kind of on that last note, there are lots of other images. Here's an image that really highlights the de-emphasis of stars. This is the region near Rigel, another very bright star. Uh, but uh, to be able to show off this very faint nebulosity, one of the other themes that I didn't highlight, uh, but a very important thread in astrophotography is the ability to remove gradients from images because you want any of the faint background virtual sky stuff to really be of of the sky and the object, and not to just be some either instrumental or sky-induced uh, gradient. And so the reduction of gradients in images is a really big thing. With DBE in PixInsight, 
it really became possible to make images like that. Or what I wanna show you is, and I think I have it here, let's see. No, so I must have put it in clusters because I can't remember where I put things. Yes. So this is a, a different way I think of, you know, showing off the Pleiades, a way that most people don't because it's really showing, again, these outer bits of nebulosity that are in the field. So I'm, I wasn't so much interested, I mean, with the astrograph, I'm not gonna get detail. What I want or not at the, you know, not in a way that you might with a longer focal length. Um, so I really wanted to highlight just literally the sky in that region. And it's only because of this ability to do, in this case, the modelization of the background to remove gradients and things that it became possible. One of the cool elements I think is you'll notice you have some blue uh, scattered light here, but then behind it clouds of dust. So you get this depth in the image that I don't think has really been shown in this kind of way before. And so again, being able to take a well-known object and try to render it and present it in a way that communicates something different. Uh, that for me is also uh, something that I've enjoyed doing throughout the years. And it is because of many of these tools that it's been possible to do that. So that's really the, the link in the story is it's from these techniques, from these different uh, choices and processing that it opens another parameter space to be creative. And that's what I've tried to take advantage of in much of my recent work in uh, astrophotography. So with that, I will pause and see if there, uh, cause that now I think I've, I've done my time. I'll see if there are any questions about anything at all, either in the talk or anything else that you might want to know. Well, that was stunning. And, and that was one of the things that I think is really impressive is that you've taken objects that many of us have seen so many times, particularly the Pleiades and done something that nobody else has ever done before where we're all used to looking at the same old stuff, at least me. I mean, and to see that, what you pulled out of that was shocking. I mean, that here, was, so that was great. An image, and here's an image that's like one of these things that you probably have never seen before, no. unless you follow me. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the digitized sky survey of this thing, you would never think that there's anything there of interest. But I saw a little hint of something and I was willing to take the risk to spend the time uh, to take a picture of it. This isn't, this doesn't glow in any narrow band image kind of thing. So it's just got to be straight RGB and you got to be willing just to spend the time in the hope that, you know, after a handful of many ex deep exposures, you can get a sense that there's something worthwhile there. But, uh, but that, that's another element of this as well is the ability to willingness to take some risks. Are there any questions uh, that came up either in YouTube or on the uh, in the Zoom room? Uh, Adam, I'm just curious the the HDR um, uh, process that you showed. Would you also use that for something like uh, the Orion Nebula, where you have like the bright? Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. In fact, now that you mention it, in fact, I would argue that that is a better way of working on the Orion Nebula than by somehow doing this multiple composite thing that yeah. people like to do. So let me just show you what I think makes this relevant. And it is a critique. I, I, I will tell you it is a critique. What can I say? Um, but if you look at people's images of the Orion Nebula, how many times they get this wonderful outer stuff, right? But how, and this applies not only to the Orion Nebula, but uh, many other objects, galaxies and everything else. So have a keen eye for this. Next time someone publishes an image of a galaxy or a nebula, look in the center where it's really, really bright. Did it lose its color, right? Mm -hmm. One of the cool things about the HDR, uh, HDR kind of techniques that I've showed is it gives you this ability to be able to see color within a region that would otherwise be too bright to colorize because what these techniques do is you compress the uh, brightness of the object in such a way is you make those values more like other values, more gray. And 
within the range of how uh, these images are, you know, in color space and whatever, how they are rendered, uh, when the pixel values are too bright, it's really hard. You lose the color saturation. It's really hard to add color. So you want to manage these brightnesses in such a way that you can colorize them. And that's what I've done here um, in the Orion Nebula. And that's not something that you'll generally see done very well. And it's because of that use of HDRMT. It's not just the fact that it exists, but then being able to, you know, again, uh, understanding how to use that tool requires some practice. It requires the ability to be able to see, you know, what parameters do what and understand what they're doing. That's what allows me to do something like this um, in, the, in the Orion Nebula, for example. And then you can start to see cool stuff. Like, uh, do you see here how there is a bow shock yeah. around that star? So the these stars here are blowing their stellar winds and you can see the gas being blown behind this star, resisting it. Wow. There are also bubbles here. Do you see the bubble here? There's another bubble here. Anyway, lots of cool stuff. Astrophysical stuff in these images as well. Adam, there's a couple of questions that are coming in here. Sure. Um, uh, Kurt Zapatello says, thanks, Adam. Great discussion. Any thoughts on flats overexposing the image? Also, does Summer Haven have a great pie shop? Still have a great pie shop. Okay. So Summer Haven, uh, let me answer that one. It does still have the pie, I believe, although I haven't been there in a while because of the pandemic stuff. I haven't gone through town. I've been to the mountain, but not gone through town. Uh, they're also well known at the general store for the fudge that the general store makes. Um, so yeah, and the other question was, um, hold on, what was the other one? The, uh, um, what was the first part? Oh, I just, I, uh, it was uh, any thought on flats overexposing flats. the image. All right, got it. So the thing about flats, which is of some interest, I don't know if this answers the question, but the funny thing about flats is that the brightness of the flat is not the most important thing to the being successful or being a, a useful flat. Uh, a lot of people get hung up on how bright the flat is. That isn't the part that controls it. Unfortunately, it's usually the calibration of the flat with either a bias or a dark frame or, or light leaks or something else that's affecting it that causes a flat to be bad. So my first thought at this question, and I don't know if it answers the question, uh, but it's not the brightness of the flat that usually causes a problem. I mean, if it's truly overexposed, then that is a problem. But as long as you're within the linear range of what your sensor does, somewhere in the middle, a third, a half, whatever, it's fine. That's not the big problem. Um, Carl Lancaster, I guess, had his hand up. I didn't see any question, though. Oh, no, I didn't post the question. Uh, Adam, oh, there you how are. How are you doing? Hi. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, quick question. Uh, do you, use, uh, you don't use Photoshop anymore at all, do you? Or just or only oh, rarely? I, I don't use Photoshop. I'm not, yeah. I don't completely not use it. Uh, yeah. obviously in the yeah. tutorials, so I should point this out, yeah. in the tutorials that I do, I exclusively show solutions which are um, PixInsight based. I know many other solutions, right? Um, yeah. But I'm going to be showing in my tutorials PixInsight-like solutions to problems. Uh, so there are, and, and many of the solutions in PixInsight are wonderful. There are a few things that um, I think could be improved. But um, yeah, so this is my yes. website here for the instructional videos. If you okay. are interested in learning more about PixInsight and image processing in general, please visit uh, the website here at adamblockstudios.com. And yep. you'll see that I have a number of different products that are available, both what I call fundamentals and PixInsight Horizons. Yeah, I was, just, I was kind of curious the percentage of the... Uh... How, how much you use PixInsight versus uh, Photoshop, but uh, anyway. I would say it's on the order of 95% PixInsight. All right, okay. Okay, thank yeah. you. Cool. Um, Chris Hartnett uh, had asked a question too. Uh, what is a recommended software package for enhancing images for a beginner in astrophotography? And he says, PixInsight? Uh, no. All right, so, <laughs> so let me answer that question. I'm gonna answer that question, I think. I think it's the appropriate answer um, because it's on the screen right now. PixInsight does not have a, a whole lot of documentation, although that is being addressed at the moment. There's an individual whose job it is now to write documentation. Uh, that wasn't true in the past, but it is true today. And I think, by the way, 
that people like myself have made that more of a thing uh, for the developers of PixInsight. They, I mean, they've always recognized that, you know, having documentation is important, uh, but being able to put money and time to it is, is another thing entirely. So they're doing that now. Uh, but uh, as far as for a beginner is concerned, the software isn't difficult for a beginner because of the software itself. You see, part of what astrophotography is, is an understanding, and this is, this is for me, right? It's an understanding of the concepts of astrophotography. You've got to understand something about light, a little something about the sensors, something about what it means to take a number of images and combine them together mathematically. Listen, you can use a software program that hides all of that from you, but then it is formulaic. It is a recipe. You are just going to understand what sliders and buttons and things to do to make things work in that software. PixInsight is different in that the buttons and sliders come with this idea that you understand the concepts of astrophotography. So it's the concepts that I teach in addition to how to use PixInsight. So as a beginner, is PixInsight a fine program? Absolutely. If it comes along with that information, if you, would, if you don't mind learning about the concepts of astrophotography, I'm here for you. That is what I do best. I explain not only the buttons and sliders and things to do, but I explain why you're doing it. And I actually have a particular uh, module for it. I call it fast track training. So for just uh, $60, you can get a three to four hour course that takes you through the very beginnings of PixInsight. So by the end of it, you will be able to take your own data and at least calibrate it and make something that looks like a color picture. I have that for beginners right now in fast track training. And then if you actually look here, I'm, I'm gonna advertise because the person asked, right? So I'm gonna advertise <laughs> it. Uh, it gets good reviews. We did tell you it was okay for you to plug your site when we invited you. There you go. Well, I didn't actually until the end here, but here I am doing yep. it. Yep. It's, it's gotten some please, good reviews. Please do so, tell. <laughs> so, uh, so I would say that uh, you, you will find a home for beginners at Adam Block Studios. Yeah, I think, I think for my, my two cents there is all roads lead to Pix Insight. <laughs> uh, and... Um, you know, I do agree. There are a lot of uh, tutorials out there. There are a lot of websites and they tend to just give you the, you know, there, there's a couple guys, I forget their names, that have a whole series where you can go to some live webinars, whatever. And they just tell you, plug these numbers in and go, right? And that is, to me, it's not it's not helpful. And I think the- That's know, the recipe, it, right? That's the recipe. But he's, he's just, you know, again, to Adam's credit, he didn't ask me to plug his site right, at, at all. It, I do find it incredibly helpful. Like he actually builds up these exercises. Like let's start like again, like even with morphological morphological transformation. What I just like, so let's start with one pixel in the center uh, and run the algorithm. And it really is building from those fundamentals and teaching you the, the why it works. And I will tell you, it, it's there is no better way to learn that. Uh, if, if you just want to set the dials and go, I mean, it's just you, you'll get so far. But as soon as you're running into any kind of a problem, you right. find yourself kind of searching around for how, how do I actually fix this? And, and trust me, you'll still get frustrated. But I, I think uh, I, I would I would recommend that you <laughs> jump right into that Pix Insight and give it and give it a shot. Yeah. So there's there, yeah. there's one element there's one element which is solving the problem, and then there's the meta element which is um, which is some of what I tried to show here. It is that. Once you get to solving your own problems, you may even find your own innovations. Uh, and, and that's the next kind, that's the guru level, right? Where you're actually making a new technique or something that works in a way that, uh, you know, that might solve a problem that even other people would be interested in. Uh, so yeah, that there's all these different levels of appreciation of the art of uh, doing this astrophotography and image processing. And another question here is, uh, I'll try and yell over my crickets in the background, but- uh, You know, I didn't want to actually hear crickets in my presentation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. Yeah, that I actually bring the crickets to the uh, to the talk here. Okay. Yeah. But uh, what tools in PixInsight are best for tracking gradient or tackling gradients? Uh, DBE only, and what techniques are most effective? So one of the recent things that I 
uh, worked on. And uh, let's see, do I want to show it here or, you know, I have this YouTube channel too. I don't know where my YouTube is. Oh, here it is. So I have a, a YouTube channel as well. And I have lots of, if I go to my home page, I don't know, you guys can look up the YouTube channel. Um, here, there I am, YouTube. Uh, I've got a ton of videos and one of the most recent ones is of this thing called normalized scale gradient. It doesn't remove a gradient, but it simplifies it. So uh, simplifies gradients because of the way that you normalize images. So I would highly recommend, please look into this thing before I say the other thing that is of course most useful and powerful uh, is proper flat fielding first. And then of course, DBE is the way to, you know, to remove gradients. But what, what makes DBE's life even easier is this normalized scale gradient script, which I think will eventually become the, the way that it is done in image integration. Right now, uh, this is an outsourcing of the normalization that image integration does, because this script, in my opinion, does it better and more, uh, more accurately. Uh, and one of the byproducts is that it simplifies gradients. So that's the answer to the question. The answer is DBE, but make DBE's life easier by using this script. So I'd highly recommend look into it. Very cool. Um, yeah, and then uh, Zepatello also said, look at the moon tonight. The moon is crazy red here. If you guys no. take a peek at it, it is uh, very insane looking. Um, anything else? I'll just give Adam a plug. I, after he gave me the, that free sort of two hours of help, I did buy his, uh, his course. And it, 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 it takes you through what is really a, beyond a PhD level piece of software and really breaks it down into ways you can get into it and not feel like you need to go back to graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing is some people argue there is an argument. So I, I will be very clear about this. I don't want to hide this. This is the Adam Block way. There are people who do not want all of that information. They just say, Adam, gosh, darn it. Tell me now how to do this thing. I want to make a picture. I don't want to learn about all this stuff and wait to make the picture later. There are the people that want to read this, you know, the, the, the end of the book and find out what happens before they read the whole thing, right? Or something. I don't know. Um, so in my coursework, I kind of accommodate people, though it's not the recommended way. One of the things that I do is I make these workflows available where I show people. I just show. I don't, uh, don't explain everything there because I'm assuming that everyone's listened to the explanation beforehand. But I just go through the workflow of generating these different images. Um, and you're just basically looking over my shoulder. So my default method is to explain at a way where you, that people do feel like they're going back to school a little bit. Uh, but I also do accommodate this need to, you know, start doing something with imagery, images very quickly. All right. Well, I think if, is there any more questions? Is there, does anybody have anything else that they'd like to add or subtract? What would you recommend for an alternate hobby? Knitting, bowling? <laughs> <laughs> table tennis. Table, table tennis. Table I knew tennis. he was going to say table tennis. <laughs> there you go. Um, we just found out recently, uh, at least we did, that Adam is uh, quite the uh, table tennis guy. He, uh, how, how long, are you, how long are, you, are you a pro? I, I saw the Caesars stuff when you're on your search list there. You go to Caesars and, and play? Or? Why don't I do this? <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> oh snap yeah so uh if I, I don't know how i let me just see if okay this is me so uh, i have a tournament rating so i play competitively in tournaments mostly locally here in phoenix um and so this for people that play will give you some sense of my level of skill you can actually look at my uh <laughs> my history through time i've been playing for maybe 20 years or so but only maybe in the past 10 years have I gotten really kind of uh, more serious about it in terms of really trying to make it something that I'm, I'm I have goals. I want to be a 2100 player. And for anyone that knows what level of skill that is, that's, um, that's something to do. Well, you're a man of many talents and, uh, you know, I just can't thank you enough for uh, 
you know, Steve putting this together to, to encourage you to come and, and uh, talk to us. And that was a great talk. Even for people that don't know much about astrophotography, to see what you can do with the, the data that you have. I mean, you got great telescopes, but what you do with it is the important part. I mean, it, it really is amazing. Yeah. But Dan, yeah. paraphrasing that old adage, oh, never mind, I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you know, one of the interesting things is that uh, I try is in my in many of my instructional things to take other people's data, especially if it's problematic or even in some of those workflow videos. And I use their because, you know, people say, Adam, your data is always so good or whatever. It's not that the data is not always good. But if I take someone else's data, at least, you know, now I'm doing it authentically. Right. Uh, the funny thing is about that, that I then get the opposite complaint where when you take someone else's data, it is imperfect in many different ways. And so I have to, you know, go off these other directions in order to compensate or accommodate whatever the problem might be. And then I get the complaint, Adam, I, I don't want to see all that stuff. Just tell me what the, you know, what the <laughs> straight and narrow is. And I go, I can't win this argument of uh, whether I should be using very nice data or using problematic data, right? Well, again, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I hope that if you, if you make it out to New York City, that you can come up and see us and that, uh, you know, that uh, we can all get together at, a, at another time. That'd be great. There are a couple of great uh, table tennis clubs up there. So I'd love to uh, visit. And, uh, do oh, that. we would go to that. Absolutely. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll be there for those. That'd be a lot of fun. Well, next, uh, next month, uh, we are back in person again, at least for one month. And we've got tickets are on sale now. And uh, I think there's probably a queue. But the Bob Meadows Stellar Fate Report is uh, is back, and uh, and hopefully we'll see a lot of you at Stella Fane. That's just uh, another couple of weeks from now, and uh, what a great experience it could be this year. I hope a lot of people come out for it. I hope it's I hope it's a good time. We'll see. I hope we have good weather. It's not Aqua Fane, but uh, yeah. And so yeah, <laughs> it'll be good. Well, thank you to everybody that attended tonight. Uh, everybody in the peanut gallery is just saying, wow, uh, that was uh, that was really good. And I agree. It was really good. Thank you, Adam. So until next time, until next month. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>